Hi, good evening, and welcome to another edition of, of History with Highlander. Well, you can see by our, by our topic, it's so timely. You know, 1776, the Declaration of Independence, and we just celebrated July 4th last week, so we've got a good story. We have an American story, our story. It's a great narrative, and, and let's get right to it. And the, the best way to get right to our story, what we need to do is we need to take a moment and reset the dial. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring the story back to April of, of 1775 and the events at Lexington and Concord. And we have a quick, we have a, a little bit of a, a, a bit of a painting here. And there we go, and, there, and there's Lexington and Concord. And on the Concord Green, we can see the Redcoats in the distance. And, and the Patriots, the militiamen, the, the Sons of Liberty, if you will, the, the, uh, the Minutemen are, are running, they're fleeing. The British have fired, and now they're fleeing back to their homes. And these are the first shots of the American Revolution. And, and I know, and some of you know as well as, as myself, that the that today, today the uh, Concordians, as they call themselves, and, and the Lexingtonites are still debating as to where the first shots were fired. Concord talks about the Old North Bridge. Lexington goes, goes back to the Lexington Green. Uh, we'll let them you know, deal with that. But the point I want to make, the events of April of 1775 you know, changed the whole flow of the conversation you know, at the Second Continental Congress and also across, across the nation. And to, to back the story up just a bit, to turn the needle back, that in September of 1774, these are where sequencing is important, in September of 1774, the First Continental Congress adjourned, and they adjourned to return home. The, to, to get the crops in and to prepare for the winter. And when they adjourned, they, they, they all agreed that they would meet again in the spring of 1775. So when they adjourned in September of 1774, what we have is we have a war of words. Taxation without representation is tyranny. And they were throwing words at each other rather than musket balls. Yet when they reconvened in April, of 1775, the whole situation had changed on the ground. A war of words had been replaced by, well, had been replaced by bullets. Militiamen, civilians from all walks of life had fired on the British troops, His Majesty's troops. I mean, this, th this changed the whole flow. And as thousands of militiamen cha chased the British soldiers out of Concord through Lexington, through Arlington, down the old Great Road into Boston, that the that Second Continental Congress was meeting. And now the whole situation was changed. As I said, a war of words had now be, been replaced by, by bloodshed. Blood had been drawn. And, and how do we deal with this? And if one were to poll, you know, the delegates who were arriving, you know, one by one from, from their various colonies to, in Philadelphia in April of 1775, the R word on their lips was reconciliation, not revolution, not yet. And, and those who sought revolu reconciliation were basically from the middle colonies, Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey to an extent, Delaware, uh, a bit of the, uh, some of the New Yorker delegation as well. And as they gathered, you know, Massachusetts selected five men to represent the interests of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And let's roll them out. Let's reintroduce them. They're our boys. They're, they're the homeboys. John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Robert Treat Payne, and Elbridge Jerry. And, and as these five men, you know, rattled, you know, rattled along those rutted roads from Boston to Philadelphia, rattled in their coach, John Adams, who what a surprise, appointed himself the, the senior member, if you will, that John Adams knew, and he counseled these gentlemen, that when we arrive at Philadelphia, zip your lip. There's John Adams right here. You know, zip your lip. We have a, a reputation here in Boston of being hotheads, certainly, certainly. And, if, and, and all he had to do was to tick off the home invasions of loyalists, those who wished to pay their taxes, home invasions of, 
home invasions of tax collectors. Okay, we could take John down. Kind of a crusty looking fellow, isn't he? And that Boston had a reputation. We had a chip on our shoulder. Uh, actually, a two by four. You know, and along with home invasions and tarring and feathering and, and harassing tax collectors, you know, we have, the, we have the Boston Massacre, we have the Boston Tea Party, and now, and now the Peace de Resistance. You know, we have the gunshots at Lexington and Concord. Where do we go from here? And Adams counseling his co-delegates that let me do the talking. You know, let's not, you know, let, let's not antagonize the moderates, those that are seeking reconciliation, because they're going to have their guard up against us. And, and can't you see it? You know, when, can't you see it when the Massachusetts boys walked in and one delegate looking at another and saying, here they are, they're over my left shoulder, here they are. Uh, which one is Hancock? Uh, the, the tall one, the arrogant looking one. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We need to be careful, we need to be careful. John Adams knew this, and, and he had to bite his lip. And many had to bite their lip because the, the first response of the, the Second Continental Congress to Lexington and Concord was to make an effort to get back on good terms with the King of England. Many towns in Massachusetts, and maybe Stoughton, Easton, Dedham, I'm not sure. They, many, many towns in Massachusetts had already broken with Parliament. You know, that the, as they called them, you ready for this? Cover your children's ears. Uh, the pimps and parasites of Parliament. Isn't that great alliteration? Let me say it again. The pimps and parasites of Parliament, that these are malevolent men, these are venal men, these are corrupt men, uh, these are men who would, who would circumscribe our, our liberties. These, were, these are men who would, who would take tax dollars away from us without our, without our consent. We have no use for them. But the king, the king, the king was the glue, the king was the adhesive that bound the empire together. And we need to get back on good terms with, you know, with the king. So what the moderates at Philadelphia did is they sent a letter to the king. And it was called the Olive Branch Petition. It explains itself, doesn't it? We're looking for reconciliation. And that letter was sent. And Adams knew, and other delegates knew, that the king has already made up his mind. You know, that he's going to solve this, resolve this, with military force. But nonetheless, the letter was sent, and there was silence. And I can almost see, I remember, I almost remember, the, as that letter was sent and weeks passed and no response after all, depending on the weather, it took four, maybe five weeks for mail to make its way across the Atlantic, and then a response. So they waited, and there was no response. I can see them going to the mailbox and nothing, nothing yet, Ebenezer. Maybe in the afternoon mail, nothing yet. Did you, Howard, did you put enough postage on that? Indeed, I did. Edward, did you mail it to the right address? I believe so. Well, there was no response. And, and Adams expected this. And Adams now began to make his moves. He and the Massachusetts delegation with others, particularly a, a man by the name of, of Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee, that what, what we need to do is we need to pull Virginia in. We need, to, we need to broaden this so that the conflict, the trouble is, is more than a New England problem. We need, to pull in, we, need to pull in, we need to pull in Virginia. I mean, Virginia was the first colony. Virginia had political talent. Virginia had military talent. Virginia had George Washington, you know, the only man with any you know, military experience at all. And we need to pull in Washington, a Virginian. We need to pull in Thomas Jefferson. You know, so handsome, beginning to gray out a little bit. Uh, his hair had been very reddish. He and John Adams were quite friendly. Uh, Adams had met Jefferson at the First Continental Congress, and they liked one another. And Adams wanted to coach up Jefferson. Adams was 10 years as his senior, but I want to coach him up. You know, Adams and Jefferson were, were quite friendly, and, and that friendship didn't dissolve until after the revolution when political parties surfaced. In fact, let me tell you how, let me, let me give an example of just how close Adams and Jefferson were until politics got in the way. That'll do it, won't it? Always that'll do it. That the, when, when Jefferson died at, dined at the Adams homestead, the, the Adams children referred to him as, as Uncle Thomas. I mean, Abigail, Abigail Adams, and she told John this. 
You know, the Thomas Jefferson is one of God's finest creatures. And I can almost hear John Adams saying, because he was vain, yeah, he was touchy, that, what am I, Abigail? Chopped liver? And, and Thomas Jefferson was smitten with Abigail Adams. He found her so clever, uh, quick-witted, a bit of a tease, a bit of a coquette. And, 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 and what is she doing married to John Adams, you know, so cranky? In fact, these men were so friendly, and, and this rarely happens today, if ever, that John Adams, out of friendship, out of affection for Thomas Jefferson, uh, signed a contract with a, with, a, with a portrait painter, his name was Mather Brown, to do a portrait of him, John Adams, to, pre to present to his good friend, Jefferson. But Jefferson was to so taken with that gesture of affection and friendship that he had a portrait done of him by the very same portrait painter. You know, so th and he could present that to John Adams as a gift, as a sign of my affection for you. And all of that will change, of course, as I said, with the end of the revolution and the, and the arrival of political parties. So, Adams, we, I need to recruit three Virginians. We need to bring Virginia in. Virginia, the first colony, with Massachusetts, the second colony, and to build a bridge between Massachusetts and Virginia. Virginia and Massachusetts. And, and in discussing together the option of independence, that that discussion that Adams hoped and Jefferson hoped you know, would create an undertow you know, that would pull in the, the, the other delegates and the other colonies when they realized we have no alternative. Well, we have an alternative to submit or to gamble. Revolution, a declaration of independence. Indeed, and they knew this, that to declare independence and to sign that document, that was treason. That was rank treason. There were consequences to be hanged. Your property, your, your home, your homestead burned to the foundation and your family scattered. There were consequences and they knew this. These, would, uh, these were no ordinary times. And, and these were men, of, these were men of, of property, of banking, of finance, of trade. Uh, these were men with families. Uh, these were men who had receding hairlines, expanding waistlines. I think I just described myself. They knew there were consequences here if they began to think in real terms, in bold terms, about a declaration of independency. In fact, one way to take a look at, one way to view the declaration is to view it as a, as a declaration of war against Great Britain, against the king. And, and, for, and for the British in Parliament and Lord North and George III, uh, this is an existential threat. It threatens the integrity. It threatens the wholeness of the empire. This was a struggle over power. Where does power reside? In London or among the 13 colonial legislatures? So all of this is part of the discussion. And the third Virginian that John Adams wanted to pull in, and this was a man that he met in the First Continental Congress, and a man who already had crossed his Rubicon. And by that, by that I mean that he had decided that independence was the only option. And we have to wait for the silliness of this letter, the Olive Branch Petition, to wait for that to all to play out. And this Virginian, his name was Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee. You know his son. His son was Robert E. Lee, the Confederacy, the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. And the irony, here his dad is building a union, and his son, Robert E. Lee, is looking to destroy the union, to, uh, to disintegrate it in, in April of 1860, 1861. History is so rich with these ironies. That's what makes it great, isn't it? I mean, history is, is such a moving narrative, and it, it, um, it can get told in, in many different ways. So here is Adams. Adams, my first Virginian, George Washington, Adams. I'd like to make a nomination. And he makes, an, um, he makes a motion to the, to the entire Congress to appoint General Washington as commander of the Continental Army. Now, he's the only one with any military experience. And by the way, he did not perform very well out in the Ohio Valley during the, during the French and Indian War, but he's the only one with any military experience. And that motion by John Adams to appoint the Virginian, George Washington, to head a Continental Army, that motion was seconded by Samuel Adams, and the motion carried. And, and frankly, Washington is an army of one. And he makes his way to Cambridge 
to take control, if you will, to whip that those group of, of ragtag militiamen, the, uh, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, all those men who would chase the British through Concord, through Lexington and Arlington, and now had them bottled up in Washington, in, in, in Boston. And when Washington arrived in Cambridge, he was, he was distressed. He was, he was, this is my army, these guys, look at how they dress. Their campsite looks like a gypsy camp, and they're up all night, drinking and firing, uh, playing cards and firing their weapons and, and, and having these roaring bonfires. It's like, a, it's, like, it's like an outing with ninth graders. This is my army. He shook his head in disbelief. And they want to address me by my first name? I'm George Washington. I'm an aristocrat. I'm a planter. I'm a wealthy man. I have hundreds of slaves. And you want to address me by my first name? And you want to elect your officers? What fresh hell is this? And I'm going to make, I'm, I, I'm going to take on the mightiest empire since Caesar's Rome? Well, over time, Washington came to appreciate the fighting, the fighting capabilities of, of Massachusetts men. And we all know, don't we? You all, and remember with me, you know, that'll be Brigadier General uh, Glover, John Glover, and his Marblehead fishermen, you know, who will save the, save the revolution in August of 1776. You see, in August of 1776, that Washington decamped from Cambridge to go to New York because the king had decided, as I said a moment ago, on a military solution. And he had brought in General William Howe, and he brought in his brother, Admiral Richard Howe, the Army and the Navy, to gather an army and to gather a navy. And I can hear both of these men, Sire, I shall command Sire, and to sail for New York. New York was teeming with loyalists, to sail for New York and to crush the rebellion in a single battle. Hang a few, pardon the others, and you know we'll all get we'll all get back to we'll all get back to a peaceful empire. And I'm I'm thinking here that the it was never peaceful. You know, that American Revolution, and I just want to take a side trip with you, please, if I may. It has a haze around it, a, a glowing haze. It has an aura, you know, that it was uh, full of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's only part of the story. The American Revolution was a bloody, bloody, nasty, vicious affair. And that rarely gets picked up in the sacramental treatment of the American Revolution. There's new scholarship out there that is beginning to dig into the how violent that revolution was. And when Lord Dunmore, uh, go, uh, the uh, royal, royal governor of Virginia, encouraged indentured servants and slaves to free, to, uh, to run, you will be free, run into British lines. And he did that not because he believed in, 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 in manumission of slaves, and indentured servants, but to weaken, you know, the American war effort. Uh, that was seen as a very bloody, bloody thing and, and, uh, and dangerous policy on the part of Lord Dunworth, seen by those who drafted the Declaration of Independence. So we have one Virginian in, and now we need to go to the drafting, the crafting, to be able to think out loud about the independency. And this is when Adams approached his good friend, the Virginian, Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee. He said, Mr. Lee, a word, sir, Mr. Lee, would you make a motion that we form a committee? We form a committee to, to put words on paper, to think out loud about the ideas of why we should be independent, the charms of liberty, and that it's nothing to fear. And that thought about the charms of liberty, that we can do this on our own, had first been inserted into the conversation, and this was a conversation that would take place after church services, at town meeting, at the tavern, around the dinner table. And this was introduced into the, you know, into the conversation by, by a pamphlet by, by Thomas Paine, and it was the most widely read pamphlet of the American Revolution, 46 pages. It speaks for itself. Its title was Common Sense. And it spoke to the common sense reasons as we can be independent, you know, that we can protect ourselves, we can trade, and that the Lord has given all of us enough intelligence, wisdom, courage, and fortitude 
to be able to govern ourselves. We do not need Parliament. Indeed, we do not need the King of England either. And it will be Thomas Paine who will first publicly attack the King in common sense. And he'll do so this way. You're going to enjoy this. That Thomas Paine referred to the King as the royal brute of Britain. I like that alliteration too. That's right up there with the pimps and parasites of Parliament. The royal brute of Britain. And then later on in his pamphlet described the king as a sullen tempered pharaoh. And I can, I can just see the king receiving his copy of this, faxed of course, and looking it over and calling in Lord North. Uh, Lord North, sir, Lord North, uh, who is this fellow, Thomas Paine, who refers to me as the royal brute of Britain? Lord North, who is this chap? Oh, sire, he's one of them. And we'll get him too. So it's Thomas Paine who will begin to throw the first rocks, name-calling, at George III. Thomas Jefferson and the Second Continental Congress will wrap that up, and we'll do that together shortly. So Adams to Lee, Mr. Lee, would you make a motion on the floor that we form a committee to put words on paper as to why we can take the wheels off, the, the training wheels off the bicycle, and that we can do this on our own. You know, we do not need the protection of the mother country, of king and parliament. And Lee said, I'll make that motion. And then he asked Adams, Mr. Adams, why will you not make that motion? You made the motion on General Washington. And Adams said, I can't make that motion. People know I'm cranky, I'm a hothead, I'm vain, I'm stubborn, I'm argumentative. And those were his good qualities. Ask Abigail, his wife. You, sir, are very well liked. And when you make that motion, would you please, as part of that motion, make sure I'm on that committee? And my good friend, Thomas Jefferson, you know, he's such a skilled writer. And on that committee was Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and Robert Livingston of, Robert Livingston of, of where? Of New York. What a great look. There's a, there's a face that invites conversation. I mean, Benjamin Franklin was the oldest delegate there at 70. Thomas Jefferson, at 32, was the youngest delegate there. And as the, as the motion carried to form a committee of the five men I've just mentioned, that it was clear to the delegates that no one has to sign anything, and no one has to, no one has to vote for anything. We're just putting words on paper. And that committee of five, Livingston, Sherman, really really became a committee of three, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin. Now, I don't know what happened to Sherman and Livingston. Uh, let's see, it's April. I don't know, maybe they were going to the uh, Phillies baseball game. I'm not sure. But a committee of five was a committee of three. And as John Andrews remembered, you know, many years later, the three of them sitting around the table, Benjamin Franklin said, I'm not writing anything. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play my AARP card. You know, I'm, I'm the most senior guy here. I'm not writing anything. I'll look it over. I'll make some suggestions. John Adams said, I can't write it. I can't write it. Everybody thinks I'm cranky and I'm vain and that I've got a chip on my shoulder. For some, if, if, I, if it emerges that I'm the lead writer, that might be enough for them to vote it down. And then they turn to Jefferson. Ah, Mr. Jefferson, sir, you're the youngest man here, and we're pulling rank on you. We're pulling our senior status on you, and you're an excellent writer. And Jefferson always traveled with two items, a trunk full of books and a, a laptop. You heard me right, the first laptop. It wasn't a laptop, of course, but it was for 1776. It was a portable writing desk. Remember the old TV tables? You'd, let, you'd open it up, and when you were finished watching, I don't know, I Love Lucy or something, you lifted the top, the legs pulled in, and you put it away in the TV table rack. And Jefferson was the inventor of that, and he always carried that with him. He carried on such a voluminous correspondence. You know that Jefferson wrote about 18,000, 19,000 letters, not, not to mention his pamphlets and scientific tracts and, and so forth. If you want to read something that's very interesting to get you know, into the mind of Thomas Jefferson, it's called Notes on Virginia. And it's doable. It's maybe a couple, 300 pages. Granted, it's the 18th century, and it, it reads as if the, it's the 18th century. 
but to be able to get into the, a life of the mind. You see, Thomas Jefferson always talked about a life of the mind. And to be able to get into the, the mind of Thomas Jefferson, notes on Virginia. You know, Jefferson always said that the, as I said, at the end of the revolution that the, the America, the, the Declaration was an expression of the American mind. Well, it was of some American minds. John Adams is right. Again, a third supported the revolution, a third remained loyal, and a third hoped the whole thing would blow over. So if you add up the thirds, two-thirds, either hoped the whole thing would blow over or they remained Tories. You know, they remained loyal to the king. J Thomas Jefferson also, that life belongs to the living and that we need to avoid, as he, uh, as he, as he, as he described it, you know, we, we need to avoid monkish ignorance. You see, life belongs to the living. And that he would, he, would, he would say to you, he would say to us today, tonight, this, you know, that the, that the United States of America was something brand new, brand new in history, absolutely brand new. The only nation created for the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of its citizens. Not the king, not the church, God forbid, for Jefferson, and certainly not the aristocracy. The first the first nation in history for the life, liberty, and happiness of its citizens. And, and that entailed freedom. It entailed liberty. It entailed the acknowledgement, the recognition that all of us are in the full flow of life. And it's the role of government to allow us to make, make of ourselves you know, what we want to make of ourselves. Not the king, not the aristocracy, and, and, not, and not the church. As Adams remembered years later, it took Jefferson a day and a half to put the Declaration of Independence together. And the Declaration of Independence went through, count them, seven revisions, seven. Look at the first revision of the Declaration of, of Independence. And there it is. And, and, and this is a great example of what I like to call patriotic art. And, and, this, and this is not an attempt to to give us an exact, an, an exact remembrance of it, but it's, it's, it's making a case, if you will. It's, the, it's not as it really occurred, but as an artist wants us to look at it and remember the event, not remember it in, in a very specific way. And isn't that wonderful? There's Franklin seated, and look at, look at the painting. The buckles on the shoes of all of them, the buckles on the, on the, on the shoes, the, uh, uh, the silk stockings, the waistcoat, and what I like about this is the, rumble, the rumpled up paper on the floor. It looks so contemporary, patriotic art. And this is the first revision of the Declaration of Independence. It went through, as I said, six more, a total of seven. And if you look to your far left by the open window, tacked on the wall is a copy of an almanac. Benjamin Franklin devised the almanac, and the date reads 1776. And there's a schooner, there's a boat up in the corner. It's so colonial, it's so wonderful, it's so bright in its color. And there is the first set of revisions. And Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin makes a very important singleton revision. When they looked at the first draft of the Declaration, Jefferson had written life li the life liberty and the pursuit, of ha uh, the pursuit of property. Back then, back then a man's wealth was measured in land and property. And Benjamin Franklin, always very sociable and, and willing to compromise and, and willing to talk it through, said, Mr. Jefferson, this phrase is wonderful. Life, da-da, liberty, da-da, and then property. It doesn't sing, it doesn't soar, it's a, it's a, it's a sour note. It's an off-key note. Life, liberty, dirt, it, it, we, need to, we need to lift it. And Franklin thought for a moment, as he did, said, so Mr. Jefferson, how about the word happiness? Would you be willing to insert the word happiness? Outstanding, Dr. Franklin. It lifts the whole thing. It lifts the entire piece. You see, the Declaration of Independence is poetic. It's, it's pitch perfect. It's meant to be read aloud. 
and, and oftentimes I wish more people would read it. I mean, it's not the Constitution, but it is a promise to America and to the world. And as Jefferson said, these words will, will be a model for unborn generations. Adams didn't see it that way. He said this document is viable for, for, for our people in this moment, at this time, in this historic circumstance. Well, he was wrong about that. You know, and all we need to do is to, you know, look at, look at a, the history that followed the, the American Revolution. I'll be contemporary with you that in the uh, Lech Walesa and, the, and Solidarity in Poland, I mean, they quoted from the, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, on the Berlin Wall, words from the Declaration of Independence, in German, of course. Ho Chi Minh. When Ho Chi Minh declared independence from France at the end of World War II, Ho Chi Minh did not quote Marx. He did not quote Lenin. He quoted Thomas Jefferson. So, I mean, this is an enduring document. Uh, this, was, this was a document for their time and for all time. Uh, again, Adams didn't quite think that the, the situation would ever repeat itself just that way. For Adams, Adams taking a look at the Declaration, he inserted the phrase that these truths are self-evident. Jefferson had sacred. And, and the reason self-evident is that it's, it, they, they stand alone. It's obvious that we are good men and women. You know, we, we are men of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, and that the Lord has given all of us enough wisdom and courage and bravery and fortitude and ability to be able to govern ourselves. The charms of liberty, let's embrace them. Let's not fear them. Here's that first revision. And this is Jefferson. And you can see how, you know, that he has lined out lines. And this is his working draft. You know, and other, and other revisions were made as well by Jefferson, you know, and also by, as I said, Adams and Franklin a declaration by the representatives of the United States. It's in capital letters, isn't it? Now, there was no United States yet. Uh, this is 1776. It's going to take three years of war, blood, death, expense, fear, consequences before this declaration becomes a reality. So let's go to the, let's go to what most people incorrectly think is the signing document. There it is. Now what are we looking at here? We're looking at here, not the signing document. Uh, this is a painting by Jonathan Trumbull. It's enormous. It's on display at the National Archives. And these are the five. And we know that it's, and there's John Adams in the reddish jacket with his hand on his hip. And center is Thomas Jefferson. And to Jefferson's left is Benjamin Franklin, and then we have Sherman and Livingston. And they're presenting John Hancock, who was seated, you know, with the Declaration of Independence. And what I like to point out to everyone tonight is look at look at the delegates, look at the you know, seated. You know, everybody some are standing, of course, you know, but everybody looks perfectly calm. You know, their legs are crossed. All that's missing is a cup of Dunkin' Donuts. I mean it, it makes it look like this is a day at the beach. They're committing treason. They haven't signed anything yet, but they know there are consequences. And look deep into the painting, and notice the chap who's standing, uh, the, only one, the only guy with a hat on his head. He's inside a building as well. And, and this is the delegate from, this is one of the two delegates from Rhode Island. And this fellow's name is Stephen Hopkins. And, and later on in tonight's broadcast, we'll take a look at the, at the signature. Of, of Stephen Hopkins, among others as well. But this is an idealized painting. Again, it's, it's, it's patriotic art. I mean, it's wonderful. It captures a moment in our history, not exactly as it occurred, but in ways that an artist years later is, is remembering it for us. And it's, it's wholesome, and it's, it's necessary, and all the players are there. And there's the signing. And there's John Hancock. Now, John Hancock signed it in that swirl. And he signed it that way, not because he was vain. I mean, they all had vanity. I mean, how can one not have that vanity? And, and Hancock 
No, I was there. I can be most anywhere I want to be. And he signed it that way. And he said, he did not say, so the king can read it without his glasses. What he said was, and I was there, that I'm not going to hide my name among 55 others. Uh, there it is. You know, there it is, Your Majesty, for you two to see and to do with as you wish. And what, uh, what the king did, he, he doubled the... He doubled down on the bounty on John Hancock's, on John Hancock's head. And to the right, and the, and the right if you look carefully now, there are four other signatures. And looking closely, you can find the Adamses, and we can find Robert Treat Payne, it's on the right, and, and, and we can find, and we can find uh, Elbridge Jerry as well. And, and Stephen Hopkins is there, and you can see to the far right, the Hopkins signature. You know, when Hopkins signed it, when Hopkins signed it, and he wanted everyone to remember at that time in 1776, there was really no signing ceremony. Uh, most delegates signed it on August, on August 2nd. Hancock signed it on, the, on August 2nd. I'll come back to that in a, on August 4th, rather, uh, July 4th. I'll come back to that in a moment. But a story about Hopkins, and he would he said this at the time, and I want, he would want me to remind um, all of you tonight. Uh, if you look at his signature, it's, it's sloppy, if you will. It's, it's not carefully constructed. It's in cursive, praise the Lord. It's too bad so many students no longer know how to write in cursive. It's all block lettering. It's all printing. And it's a sloppy signature. It looks almost like a bad EKG, like he'd be admitted to the CCU. And the reason that his signature was a bit sloppy is that he had palsy, and both his left and his right hand shook. And as he signed it, he wanted those delegates to hear these words as they watched him sign for Rhode Island. And he, want, he would want you tonight to know these words. My hand trembles, but not my, but not my heart. And he had to take his left hand, which did not tremble, as severely as his right hand, and to be able to pin his right hand down so, it, so he could minimize the shaking enough to, to be able to sign this. My hand trembles, but not my heart. And I think that, that humanizes it terrifically, doesn't it? And these men, when they signed this, they knew they were committing treason. This is rank treason. This is a declaration of war. And what they're doing in the third section of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is divided into four sections. A preamble, a statement of rebellion, a revolution, an attack on the king. Now, section three, the attack on the king, was the largest section. And your homework tonight is to read it over. It's about 1,300 words. Uh, you can read it in 10 or 15 minutes. Read it slowly. Pronounce the words out loud so you can savor them, so you can taste them so that all of you can bite down on them. And the third section, the fourth section rather, is the actual statement of the independency. And if we can go to, let's see what we have coming up here. Well, we have the, uh, the we'll leave it there. The first part of the Declaration was an introduction. And one way to read the Declaration of Independence is to read it as a, as a press release. You see, these men felt it necessary to explain themselves. And that's what the age of reason is all about, you know, an explanation. You know, we need to explain ourselves. And the Enlightenment was about explaining. And one, and you, and one explains the astrological reasons for a meteor shower or an eclipse or an earthquake or any other natural phenomenon. It's not the work of the Lord, you know, sending a message, an eclipse is not a message from the Lord. A, uh, a, a, uh, an earthquake, you know, is not the sounds of the devil, you know, rolling the gates of hell open. I mean, that's 1692. That's the Salem witchcraft trials. But we need to explain ourselves to our friends in, in Europe, to our friends in England. You know, there were in Parliament, a third of Parliament refused to vote war credits, that there was something wrong about a civil war within the empire, and that we need to, you know, we need to adjudicate this. 
you know, not to, not to solve it in a military way, you know, that will be an existential threat to the wholeness of the empire. And we also need to explain ourselves to colonists, again, those third who remained loyal and, that, and the third that hoped, you know, the whole thing would disappear and we get back on good terms with England. So when we go to the preamble, and I'll just paraphrase it for you, I mean, the opening phrase pulls us in. When in the course of human events, translation, listen up, pay attention. We need to explain ourselves. You know, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary, and that's the word, let's underline it, necessary, to, to break the, the bands which have connected us with Britain, if you will. A decent respect, a decent respect, that's the phrase, to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes to the separation. Read it. Read it slowly. What they're saying is pay attention. We're explaining ourselves to you. We have not gone mad. And then that second part, and I want to, I do not want to paraphrase it. I want to read part of it with, with you and to you. See, it all begins here. It, it all begins here. While Common Sense was the most important pamphlet, 42, 46 pages of the American Revolution, this is the document. Uh, this sets everything in motion. Uh, this, is the, this is the why of the American Revolution. That's one good way to think about it. This is the why. Uh, the Constitution is the how, how we're going to govern ourselves. And the promise, the promise is the first ten amendments. Or the promise is also contained in the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident. There you go. That men are created equal that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, and among is such an important word, among, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you, Roxanne. That among these, and what does that imply? It implies there are dozens more. Indeed, it implies the rights are infinite. These are natural rights. And there are so many they cannot even be listed. But among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the full flow of your life as you define your life in the full flow of your life. Here we go. Here's a stick of dynamite. I've lit the fuse. Can you see it? I can hear it. It's snapping and crackling and hissing in my ear. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers, their just powers from the consent of the governed. We we are not ruled, we are governed, and all power flows from the people. And those delegates whom we elect are the instruments of our power. And to expand our life, expand our liberties, and preside, provide a framework for, for the pursuit of happiness. And let's not confuse happiness with pleasure. That's something altogether different. Now, there is no capital position, the Department of Pleasure. <clears throat> that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, life, liberty, and happiness, here it is, it is the right of the people <clears throat> to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, to them, to citizens. And then the third part, the most lengthy part of the Declaration, we need to unking the king. We need to make war on our father. That's hard to do, to make war on our father, the king of England, the glue, the adhesive. And Thomas Jefferson and that Second Continental Congress is going to finish the work of Thomas Paine, the royal brute of Britain, a sullen tempered pharaoh. There are 28 indictments here against the King of England. 28 indictments against the King of England for trespassing against the good people of British North America. And let me share a few of them with you. And to make it clear, it is he, he, he. The only indictment that was completely excised from this document was the 28th indictment. And they indicted the King of England 
for the slave trade. And they took that, in, they took that entire piece out for two reasons. Some of them, most of them, were slaveholders. And even in New England, we profited from the slave trade, running slave ships to England, uh, to, uh, to, um, to West Africa, and also, and also spinning cotton into, 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 into thread, the mills of Lawrence and Lowell, and of New Bedford and Fall River. So everyone was complicit in some way with, with slavery, the slave trade. So that got completely tossed. Just a few. So what has he done? It's he, 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 to make war on the king, to one king the king. All right, let me, uh, let me shop here with you. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. Uh, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Here comes my favorite, absolute favorite. Listen to these verbs. They are active, nothing passive here. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns destroyed the lives of our people, plundered, ravaged, burnt, destroyed. I mean, it's boom, 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 boom. Nothing meek about this. We need to unking the king. And then as Jefferson very coyly segues into the, into the independence piece, very coyly, what he says is, we've asked for redress of grievances, we've asked you to stop, and it has continued. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince, the king, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. You, sire, are unfit to be the ruler of a free people. You are not deserving of our love, our loyalty, our compassion, our understanding. We need to leave. We need to separate. You're unfit to be our ruler. And the fourth part is the declaration. And again, a little bit of mischief on the part of Jefferson. Uh, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America. Uh, there was no United States of America yet. And the last line, nobody remembers this line. No one reads this line. To me, it sums up what they knew that the consequences. And that very last line, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Give me your hand. I may never see you again, but at this moment, on this date, in, in this place, I will, never, I will never forget this moment. I am with you for this day and all days. I pledge to you, take my hand, sir. I pledge to you my life, my fortune, and they didn't mean money in your pocket. It was broader than that. And my sacred honor, you know, that uh, we are in this together. Now, the Declaration of Independence was agreed to on July 2nd. What happened on July 3rd is they made revisions. They made 96 revisions. Uh, they reduced it by 25%. Uh, they made it tighter. They made it more compact. For Jefferson, for Jefferson, he was beside himself. He leaned into Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin, they have mutilated my document. And Franklin, Mr. Jefferson, if you are only remembered for this, this document will immortalize you. Years later, John Adams regretted that he had outsourced the writing of the Declaration to his good friend Thomas Jefferson, because that would have immortalized him as well, Adams. Adams was so vain, so full of himself, he wanted to be the very center of attention. Benjamin Franklin was none of that, and yet, and this is going to win you some money on a quiz show, Ben Franklin was the only, only, only member of that generation who signed all the four important documents. The Declaration, the Treaty of Alliance with France, without France we lose, the Treaty of Peace with Great Britain, and the Constitution. And there is, in New York, toppling the statue of George III. I mean, that is certainly 
an excellent, an excellent example of unkinging the king. And that statue to George III was melted down into 42 musket balls. And again, that is pitch perfect on kinging the king. And there's another great example of revolutionary art or patriotic art. That never happened. That was done by Lutze, Emanuel Lutze. That never happened. Uh, the Delaware was choked with ice. Uh, there was a, a, a northeaster boiling down the Delaware. If Washington were standing, and I believe that's Monroe holding the flag, uh, they would have been toppled into the water. You know, Washington would have died. Uh, there never would have been a revolution. Do you know that Washington's record at the end of the revolution, you ready for this? His, revolu his record at the end of the revolution was 3-9-1. and one. Three losses, nine wins, and one victory at one time. On three wins, rather, I got that backwards. <laughs> three wins, nine losses, and one tie. That gets a head coach fired. But those wins were important. Valley Forge, where he kept it all together. Saratoga, that brings in the French. And Yorktown, which, which ends it. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And, and here we have a wonderful example, again, of patriotic art. Never happened that way. How could it? And there's Washington, you know, with his aides, one of whom is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a very idealized look of Betsy Ross with her children and the flag. That flag was, was voted on, or the, or the dimensions of the flag, the configuration of the flag, was voted on in 1777. And we have 13, we have 13 horizontal bars, the white purity of intent, red, the color of bravery, of patriots, of blood. But I want to call your attention to the blue, a nation under God. And notice it's a constellation. In, in the piece of legislation which they, in which they designed the flag, they used the word constellation, that the United States of America will be a new constellation among the stars, among the stars, something new in the universe. For the first time ever, a nation, created, devoted to the life, liberty, and the happiness of its citizens. And a new constellation, and that when this generation and future generations look, look into, the, into that dark evening sky, this new constellation of the United States of America. And I know you're probably thinking that Highlander is being so romantic and naive and, and so forth, and I'm not. It was their hope. We all aspire, don't we? Uh, Hope is the last to die. Without hope, there's no, there's no aspiration. That this is something new, and we can bring it down with the telescope. Indeed, it's so bright, we can see it with our naked eye. The brand new United States of America. And this is Jefferson. This, we're fresh out of the cellophane wrapper. We are providing a model that other nations wait, may emulate. And while they may you know, change things and move around the circumference of our, of our, of our model, this is new. And Adams, it'll never, we'll never have these circumstances again. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I differ with you, Mr. Jefferson. And Mr. Adams, I differ with you. Uh, this is the end. Uh, this is 1783. This is a painting by, by Benjamin West. And if you notice, the right hand of the painting is black. To the left, we have the American delegates. And we have John Adams, and, there's, there's in the, and notice how Jan, John Adams is sitting forward. He saw himself as the chief delegate. And there, is, and there is Benjamin Franklin, and there is John Jay, and there's Ralph Lawrence, and there is Benjamin Franklin's illegitimate child. Now, why is the painting half black, blank? The British refused to sit for it. They refused to dignify with the painting, if you will, a team picture you know, the signing of the breakup of the British Empire, you know, that the western wing of the British Empire has slipped away into the United States of America. So if you will, they're poor losers. It's like looking at a, uh, a wedding album, and I know you have, where there are heads cut off, and you wonder why. That, that makes an interesting story. So half of that is missing. The British were poor losers. So, so there you have it this evening. You know, it's our declaration. And that Declaration of Independence is war, and that's blood, that's money, 
that sacrifice, and that means consequences. So your homework tonight, please read the Declaration of Independence aloud, read it slowly, and chew down on the words and bite down on the words. So, so good night, and I hope you've enjoyed our, our declaration. Be well, be good to one another, and I'll see you shortly. Good night.